Hi everyone, this is Conservation in the Classroom where you get the chance to interact with one of WWF's very own experts. We are really excited to have you guys joining us here today. My name is Kate. I will be the host of our event today. And to kick things off, I'd like to introduce our featured presenter. Her name is Dr. Meg Symington. She is the Managing Director of the Amazon here at WWF US. And Meg is here today to share some of her experiences studying in the Amazon rainforest with us. She's going to tell us a bit about what makes the Amazon so special and what she does at WWF to help protect it. So Meg, thanks so much for being here. We're so excited. If you want to just say hi to everybody real quick. Hi, everyone. I'm Meg. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to um, talking to you about the Amazon today. Great. So before I pass things over to Meg, I just want to take a few moments to say hi to everyone that's joining us. So for those of you that are watching live from the web page, you should see a box underneath the video screen there um, where you can introduce yourself and place any questions that you have for Meg during her presentation. Just a reminder, you do not need to wait until the presentation is over to ask your questions. You can place questions in there at any time, and we will do our best to get as many of those those questions answered at the conclusion of the presentation. Now, we also are fortunate to have a few special guests joining us on camera today, so I want to give them an opportunity to say hi. So first up from Milford, New York, we have Miss Brown's class at the ONC Bosey School. So if you guys are there, can you unmute your microphone and say hi to everybody? Hi. Hi. Looking good over there in Milford, New York. Okay, next up, out of Blaine, Minnesota, we have the Journey Transition Program. How are we feeling over there in Minnesota today, guys? Good. Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay, and last but certainly not least, joining us from Romulus, New York, we have Nevea and Hunter. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Happy to have you here. Okay, so Meg, without further ado, if you are ready, I think we are ready for you. If you'd like to go ahead and share your screen and take okay. it away. I will do that. Hang on just a second. Okay. I'm not in presentation mode, am I? There we go. So as I said, um, I'm Meg Symington and I work for World Wildlife Fund on conserving the Amazon forest. Um, so when I was growing up, I lived in suburban New Jersey and we had a creek in our backyard. Um, and I always enjoyed walking along the creek uh, catching bullfrogs and seeing woodchucks and muskrats and possums um, and even an occasional fox. I had a wonderful biology teacher in high school who encouraged me uh, and encouraged my interest in animals. And I ended up, uh, when I went to college, majoring in biology. So after college, I decided to go to graduate school in biology. And I ended up getting the opportunity to go to the Amazon when I was 21 years old to do research on spider monkeys at the Cochicashu Biological Station in the Manu National Park in the heart of the Peruvian Amazon. And this is a picture of me um, there. Um, the field station was very remote. Uh, we were three days by boat on the river from the nearest town. Um, I spent months at a time there, about 30 months over a five year period at the field station, sleeping in a tent, eating rice and beans and canned tuna and bathing at the end of each day in the lake. But it was completely worth it given what a special place it was. This is a picture of the field station on the, on the lake. The animals I studied, spider monkeys, are one of the largest of the New World primates. Um, and they're endangered or threatened in many parts of the Amazon. But at Cochicashu, they were abundant. And I felt very lucky to be working there. Eight years later, I had finished my dissertation on these spider monkeys. 
and I was working at World Wildlife Fund on Amazon forest conservation, my dream job. And this is a picture of me in the field uh, from a couple of years ago uh, in Brazil. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Amazon. So the scope and the scale of the Amazon are truly amazing. Almost half of the rainforest remaining on earth is found in the Amazon. It's about the size of the continental United States, uh, over 7 million square kilometers or 3 million square miles. And at least 10% of the world's known species are in this region, maybe as many as 30% once we count all the species. <laughs> Um, in a WWF report from a few years ago, WWF documented the discovery of 1,200 new species over the last 12, 10 years. That's one species every three days. So the Amazon forest is so big that it influences regional and global climate patterns, as you can see from this, from this beautiful slide. The dense forests pull greenhouse gases from the air and store them as carbon, slowing the rate of global warming. And they also play a powerful role in the water cycle, creating clouds that make weather around the world, bringing rainfall to South America's breadbasket and even influencing rainfall as far away as the Midwest of the United States. And in addition to these global benefits that the Amazon provides, the Amazon is home to amazing wildlife like the jaguar, the largest cat in the Americas, and dozens of species of primates, including this adorable squirrel monkey who hasn't learned to chew with his mouth closed, I guess. The only nocturnal monkey, the owl monkey, a family of them shown here. And the world's smallest monkey, the pygmy marmoset. On the other end of the scale, there's the giant river otter which at six feet long and up to 70 pounds is a top predator. It eats up to nine pounds of fish every day. And there are thousands of beautiful bird species, including the scarlet macaw, the blue and yellow macaw, and this amazing toucan. The Amazon is also the largest river in the world containing 15 to 20% of all the free flowing river water on earth. It flows nearly 4,000 miles from its source in the Andes Mountains in the west to the Atlantic Ocean in the east, and no bridge crosses it. It is navigable 2,000 miles upstream by ocean going vessels. The amount of water in the Amazon River is 10 times more than that in the Mississippi, just to give you a sense of the scale. And the rivers of the Amazon contain more species of fish than anywhere else on earth. Here's one of those fishes. This is the world's largest scaled fish. Its Latin name is Arapaima gigas, and it's known in Brazil as the pirarucu and in Peru as the paiche. It's very good to eat. The Amazon also has its own river dolphin the Amazon River Dolphin, which is also known as the Pink Dolphin, as you can see here from its pink sides in this photo. But although most people think of the Amazon as a vast wilderness, the Amazon is also home to about 34 million people. Many of them live in large cities like Manaus and Belém in Brazil and Iquitos in Peru, but many indigenous and traditional peoples still make their living from harvesting natural resources like rubber, Brazil nuts, and fish. It's important to remember that the Amazon spans eight countries plus the overseas territory uh, of France called French Guiana. So Brazil has the largest chunk of the Amazon, but Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela also have significant Amazon forests. So one of the biggest projects I've worked on in my time at WWF is called ARPA. It stands for Amazon Rainforest Protected Areas Initiative. And the protected areas that are part of ARPA are national parks, 
like Yellowstone or Shenandoah in the US or state parks like Baxter State Park in Maine. In 1999, WWF challenged all of the world's leaders to protect 10% of their forests. And Brazil stepped up to the challenge. Over the next 10 years, the Brazilian government more than tripled the protected area system in the Amazon, creating 24 million hectares, that's an area about the size of Oregon, uh, of new protected areas over 10 years. And this map, just to show you the impact of this project, this map shows the protected areas in the Amazon in green and light green in the year 2000. And this is the picture today. The dark green areas are sort of are like national parks, strictly conserved areas. And the light green areas are sustainable use reserves where um, local people can harvest the resources sustainably. ARPA is the largest tropical forest conservation initiative ever. ARPA provides funding for boats and motors and the development of management plans for these parks. A host of things that protected area managers like this fellow, Gilmar Klein of the Brazilian Park Service, need to make sure their parks are effective and protected. ARPA also played a really important role in Brazil being able to bring down its deforestation rate by over 70% between 2004 and 2012. I'm now working on a very similar initiative for the Amazon forest of Peru, where we're going to uh, expand and improve the management of all of the protected areas, all of the national parks in the Peruvian Amazon. And this map shows those areas and you can even see, uh, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but this right here is Manu um, National Park in the southeastern part of the country where I, where I worked on spider monkeys. Uh, 35 years ago. But the Amazon is threatened. I'm sure many of you saw in the news uh, last summer and again this summer about the fires that raged in the dry season. Deforestation, unfortunately, is on the rise again. After decreasing from 2004 to 2012, as I mentioned, Deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon is now increased in five of the past seven years. And the forest loss in 2020, which the final numbers will be, be released um, quite soon, will be even worse. And unfortunately, Brazil isn't the only country where deforestation is on the rise. Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia all have increasing rates. And even though approximately 80% of the Amazon is still standing, we're approaching a level of deforestation that could endanger the sustainability of the entire Amazon ecosystem, a so-called tipping point, where a rainforest ecosystem flips to a dry forest or a savanna ecosystem. So what can we do to help the Amazon? First, we need to provide sustainable livelihoods for the people that live there that don't require cutting down the forest. How many of you have eaten an acai bowl? This uh, slide shows acai berries in a basket. People living in the Amazon can make a very good living harvesting this palm fruit from the forest. Brazil nuts and other products from the forests and rivers can be an important source of income as well for local people. Famous chefs, particularly in Lima, uh, in Peru are incorporating Amazon fruits and nuts and fish into their cuisine. We also need to support the rights of indigenous peoples to their lands. I'm working on a very exciting project right now um, that's working with the Uruwa people in the state of Rondonia in Brazil to help them use technology like drones and remote sensing to protect their territories. And this picture shows two participants in this project. We also need to support, um, we need to keep ranchers from illegally deforesting land to raise cattle. 
about 80% of all the deforestation in the Amazon is uh, caused by cattle ranching. The world has to recognize the value of the Amazon and provide support to countries so they don't need to clear the forest. Funding is needed to pay for the climate stability, the water generation, and the biodiversity that the Amazon provides. I wanna end on a story that illustrates the resilience of the Amazon. I was, it was about two or three years ago and I was traveling on the Tapajos River and we saw something in the water. Was it a caiman? No, it seemed to be a log, but then we could see it was swimming. I thought it was a taper because it was so black, but then it drew near and we could see it was a black jaguar. We looked on in awe as it approached the boat and then it swam past us, jumped out of the river and ran into the forest. In my 35 years of working in the Amazon, I had never seen a black jaguar. That was the first time. And it seemed like a sign of some kind to me. So I'm hopeful even now about the future of the Amazon. I believe we can conserve the Amazon, benefit the local people and leave a living Amazon so you can go visit it with your children someday. So please, I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I want you to keep learning about the Amazon Go home and tell your family and friends how special and important it is. Um, thanks, and I'm happy to answer your questions now. That was great, Meg. Thank you so much. As Meg said, we're going to get started with our question and answer portion now. So just a reminder to all of you that are watching from the website, you can place your questions in that um, form, that chat box area that you see under your screen there, and we will try to get to as many as we can. So let's start with one of those that was submitted on the website, and then we will um, hear from our groups on camera here. So our first question for you here, Meg, is from Kylie in New Jersey who wants to know what has been the most significant encounter with the wildlife of the rainforest that you have experienced? Well, I'd have to say the black jaguar was one of the top ones, but I did, when I was studying the spider monkeys in, <coughs> excuse me, in Manu National Park, I had to stand underneath trees very still for long periods of time. So sometimes when I was standing there, animals would walk by me and not even notice that I was there. And when I was uh, doing that, I've had a taper walk by me, almost so close I could touch it. Now tapers are the largest mammal in the Amazon rainforest. They're about the size of a pony, uh, but they have very bad eyes. So it didn't see me. And because I was so still, it just walked right by me. And I also saw a giant anteater that way. So those both, both of those were very close and very fun to see. We'll tie in another wildlife related question that we got here from Ridge Saginaw wants to know what is the scariest animal you've come across? Um, I definitely think in the Amazon, for my case, the poisonous snakes are the most, are the scariest. So there are two um, snakes that are quite deadly in the Amazon. One is called the Bushmaster and one is called the Fairdalance. And one night we were, after dinner, we were sitting in our, in our kitchen in the field station and uh, someone said goodnight and went back to their tent and they came rushing back about two minutes later and said, there's a huge snake curled up in front of my tent door and I can't get into my tent. And it turned out it was a Bushmaster, which was good that she saw it and didn't step on it on her way into the tent because that could have ended badly. I'm with you on that one. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> um, okay, let's let's go to our groups on camera here. Let's start with Miss Brown. If you guys are ready, just unmute your microphone and whoever's gonna ask our question, if you can get right up in front of the camera, nice and loud for us. He's coming up. Ask about the endangered, number three. He's lost his question, oh no. There it is. No. Okay. Oh. You remember. What is one of the most endangered species in the um, rainforest? Yeah. 
That's a very good question. Um, there are some species that are found, so the Amazon is huge, and as I said, there's 80% of the forest is still standing, which is good news, right? So, but there are some species that are um, restricted to very small areas within the Amazon. And one of the species that I'm most familiar with um, is called the emperor tamarind. It's a very cute little monkey and it's only found in southeastern uh, Peru and the northern part of Bolivia. And so if that forest were to be degraded or to be cut down, that species would go extinct. Um, there's other species that are um, overexploited. For example, um, jaguars right now are not considered endangered, but they're, they're becoming less and less common because of hunting for um, wildlife products like teeth. Um, luckily, the skin, the trade in furs, jaguar furs has declined since the 1960s when the, and 70s when that was a problem. Um, but there are, there are quite a few species that are um, at threat, at risk, and that is why we need to keep as much of the forest standing as possible. Okay, let's go to the Journey Transition Program, our Minnesota group. If you guys are ready, just unmute your microphone. What are spider monkeys? What are spider monkeys? So yeah. Spider monkeys are, um, as I said, they're one of the largest monkeys that you can find in, in, the, in the new world. There are monkeys, so there are monkeys that live in, in the old world in Africa and Asia, and then there's monkeys that live in the new world, and they're quite distantly related on the, in the big picture. But spider monkeys are one of the biggest in, um, in the new world. They are um, taxonomically, uh, very much related to woolly monkeys. If you've ever seen a woolly monkey in the zoo, perhaps they are, they eat a lot of fruit. They, they travel, they have long arms and legs, which is why they're called a spider monkey. Uh, and their tail is prehensile. So they can hang. It's like a fifth hand. They can actually hang from their tail without using their arms or legs from a branch. Um, they're very, very fun to watch. They're smart monkeys. They, they travel around the forest eating fruit from the trees. And um, I studied their behavior. Um, that was the, the topic of my, of my PhD. And they're very similar in the way they behave to chimpanzees. So it's a very interesting, what we call convergent evolution. I hope that answers your question. No, that was great. Um, okay, Nevaeh and Hunter, you guys are up. What is five animals that are on your bucket list? <laughs> um, well, I have to say, I, I, since I went to the Amazon, I've become a big bird watcher. So I do, um, there's quite a few parrots that I still would like to see. Um, I've never seen a, um, a woolly spider monkey. Those actually aren't found in the Amazon. They're found in the Atlantic forest of Brazil. But because they're like cousins to the spider monkeys, I feel like I would like to see them. Um, in terms of cats and large predators, um, I've seen quite a lot of them. Oh, there's a monkey in Brazil that I'd love to see. It's called the Wakari. It has a, you may have seen a picture of it. It has a very, it has a red face and in the males, the fur is all white. So it's a very, very strange looking monkey and it only lives in the flooded forests of, uh, of Brazil. So I'd like to see that. I've never been to the part. That's another animal that lives in a very restricted area within the Amazon and I've never been to that part of the Amazon to see it. Very cool. We've got quite a few questions in the chat here, Meg, um, of people wanting to know more about your wildlife preferences and encounters. So let's ask some of those. Um, we have a question here from Jackson who wants to know what your favorite animal, maybe in general and specifically what your favorite animal in the Amazon is. My favorite animal is definitely the spider monkey. 
<laughs> after spending five years watching spider monkeys, I feel like they're part of my family. Um, but um, otters are very cool too. Outside of the Amazon, I love whenever I go out to, um, to parks and wildlife refuges here in the United States, I love to see river otters because they're so fun. And uh, I really got to enjoy the, um, the giant otters lived on the lake that I, that I showed you that picture of. Um, but they're a little, they're so big, they're almost a little scary. Um, whereas the river otters, the river otters are just seem like they're so much fun. If I could be an animal, I think I'd like to be a river otter. Very cool. Um, we've got, while we're on the subject of wildlife, Adeline Pioneer Elementary are curious if you've ever seen a sloth. Certainly have seen sloths. Sloths are, um, uh, they're actually quite common, um, although they're difficult to see because they hold so still. I was on a trip in, in the Northern Peruvian Amazon on a, on a river trip and there was a guy who was so good at seeing sloths in the trees as we, as we uh, went down the river. It takes a, uh, a certain eye to see them because they blend in so well. Um, but yes, yeah, sloths are, are very interesting animals. They, um, I saw one once that actually, you know, they come down from the tops of the trees to, um, to go to the bathroom. <laughs> And I saw one that was on his way back up the tree and he was sort of at eye level. Um, so that was really cool. I'm sure that's quite the long bathroom trip that they had. <laughs> um, this is a fun question. Uh, Jamie in Philadelphia wants to know, what do you love most about your job? I love um, the people I work with at WWF. Everybody um, I work with, we have offices in all of the countries of the Amazon. So I work with, with uh, Colombians, with Brazilians, with Peruvians, um, and everybody is so committed to helping conserve the Amazon. Um, they're, they're very, it's very inspirational to work with the people at WWF. And of course, I, I love developing projects and getting funding for projects that I think will make a difference for the conservation of the Amazon. That's great. Okay, let's do another round with our groups on camera here. So we'll start back up with Miss Brown's class. Whoever's up next, go ahead and come right in front here. Genesis is coming up. It rains 33%. <sighs> No, you're supposed to have a question. Oh, oh, my question is, how many animals are there all together? <laughs> well, as I said, Genesis, we actually don't even know how many species there are in the Amazon. We're finding new species all the time. Um, I know that there's about, when I mentioned that there's more fish in the Amazon than anywhere else, there's over 350 species of fish in the Amazon. Um, but there are so many insects that we don't know about. Um, there's so many birds that we're still learning about. It, it's really quite incredible. It's still a wilderness and we're, we're learning so much about the species that live there. That was a good question. Um, okay, Journey Transition Program, you guys are up next. <laughs> Uh, what is a species? So the biological concept of species is species is a group that the way it's defined is they can only breed among themselves. So they can only, um, it takes a female and a male scarlet macaw to make another scarlet macaw. Species, there are some cases where animals from two different species can reproduce. The most um, famous of those is the case between a horse and a donkey. And when they have, a, have an offspring, it's called a mule. But mules are sterile, so they can't, mules can't make more mules. Um, so that's what a species is. A species are, is a group of animals that together, or plants, that basically produce fertile offspring. Okay, Nevaeh and Hunter, if you're ready. 
Have you ever seen a pink Amazon dolphin? Yes. Yes, I have actually swum in a in a part of a river where there were pink dolphins quite nearby. Um, and there are also, um, there are some places in, in Brazil, um, there's a town called Nova Erau, which is, um, they have some tame dolphins that come for a fish feeding every day at noon. So the, the, uh, the local woman who, who runs the program will hold up the fish and the dolphins actually come out of the water and, and grab the fish from her. They have very bad eyes. They really can't see much because they're adapted to being in the murky waters of the Amazon. So they find they they do everything by hearing and sonar. It's really interesting. That's very cool. Um, we actually had a question come in um, through the website that's kind of similar here from Miss Boljalski and Miss Temperi's class. They're curious if you have seen all of the animals that you showed pictures of in your presentation. Yes, I have all of those animals. Awesome. Um, they're also curious. It's kind of a two-parter question here. If you've spoken to people who live in the rainforest, I think you touched on that a little bit, but if you just want to share a little more. Yeah. So we, WWF is committed, as I said, to doing projects for the conservation of the Amazon and conserving the Amazon in a way that allows local people to live and thrive there as well. So we're doing a lot of work with indigenous peoples and local communities, helping them to um, improve ways of, of harvesting products from the Amazon sustainably so that they can make, make a living doing that. So we, I was up in, in the Rio Negro basin of Brazil a couple of years ago and went to a Brazil nut um, harvesting uh, processing plant. It was a sort of a small factory, nothing fancy. But all of the people were bringing their Brazil nuts in their boats for processing at the factory. And they would, they would crack the Brazil nuts at the factory and put them in bags and then send them for export. And you know, when you get mixed nuts from the store, they'll have those Brazil nuts in them. Um, and they're, they're quite good for you. They have a lot of good minerals and, and healthy fats. <laughs> so eat your Brazil nuts, you're helping the Amazon. There you go. That's a good lesson to take home. Um, West Craven Middle School is interested in what intrigued you the most about studying the Amazon? Like, how did you become interested in it? That's a great question, because I, um, as, as I said, I grew up in suburban New Jersey and went to college in Connecticut, and I'd never been to the Amazon. Um, but when I majored in biology um, in college, um, my advisor said, well, if you don't want to go into medicine, if you're not you know, going to be a doctor, you might want to think about going to graduate school in biology. So I, I looked into some graduate programs and um, I met the, the professor who became my advisor in graduate school. And he had just written a book called Five New World Primates. And he said, you know what? I've studied these five primates, but I need somebody to study the spider monkeys. Are you up for it? I said, wow, that sounds really cool. I'd read about um, Jane Goodall studying the chimpanzees in Tanzania. And I just thought, I like being outdoors, so I think it could work. So I took a chance. I went down for a summer and I loved it. And that's, that's, how, it, that's how I ended up studying in the Amazon. So we have a question here from Nick um, that I think is a good question to follow that up with that wants to know what it was like to live there. So, yeah, I mean, it's not for everyone. <laughs> there, um, it's hot, right? They call it a, a rainforest. They don't call it a rainforest for nothing. It's hot and humid. And in the rainy season, I, was, I only spent two rainy seasons there. The dry season is quite pleasant. I mean, it's not even as hot as it is in, in Washington, D.C. In the, in the dry season. Uh, but in the wet season, it rains a lot and the mosquitoes are horrible. <laughs> so you have to wear a lot of insect repellent. I had to wear long sleeve shirts and wear my collar all buttoned up all the time and wear insect repellent all over my face and hands because the, 
the mosquitoes were were quite quite dense. I think in Minnesota you can probably relate to that too. Um, <laughs> but um, and it was it was very um, primitive. Can't we were we lived in tents. We had a the first two years that I was there, um, we didn't even have a, a gas stove, a propane stove. So we cooked over a campfire. Um, so that was a lot of work. It took like hours every day. We would take turns, you know, making spaghetti and that kind of thing. Um, but then in about the second or third year I was there, we got a propane stove. We had a kitchen house. Um, we didn't have a refrigerator. Um, so everything that we ate was canned or dried. Um, but it worked out fine. It was, you know, it was, it was, uh, for those of you who like camping and being outside, it was certainly, it was great. It's like the ultimate camping experience there, Meg. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have enough time for another round um, from our groups on camera here. So we'll kick things back over to Miss Brown's class. If you guys have one last question you wanna ask Meg, it is your turn. Okay, Adriana's coming up. Well, I did have two questions, but That's I couldn't fun. answer. I just had one. So um, my question is, like, what kind of trees are at the rainforest? So that's a, a, a good point. I didn't talk much about the trees in my, in my talk. And the trees are what make the rainforest a rainforest. So there are trees at all different sizes in the rainforest. Um, the rainforest has sort of what we call the understory with the small trees that, that are only maybe a little bit taller than, than you are. And then it has sort of medium sized trees. And then it has these huge trees that we call emergence, canopy emergence. And those are the best trees. Those are the, my favorite trees. There are trees um, like that where the macaws nest in them and harpy eagles would perch in the tops of those. Um, they really are quite amazing, the size and scale of these trees. Um, I can't remember offhand exactly the number of species of trees they find we can find in the Amazon, um, but they're still finding new species of those as well. It's, um, it's quite impressive, this, the number of species. And there are species that are very um, useful for people like the Brazil nut trees I mentioned. You can't grow Brazil nut trees in a in a plantation. They have you have to harvest the Brazil nuts from the from the natural forest because the trees won't grow in a plantation. And that's the same. Well, with rubber, um, they still harvest rubber also from from trees. So the products that we can get from trees and the the ways that all of the wildlife that lives in the Amazon depend on the trees. So if we don't have the trees, we don't have an Amazon. That was a great question. Um, moving on to the Journey Transition Program, if you guys are ready, go ahead, unmute your microphone. Uh, what is a primate? <laughs> so primate is an order of mammals uh, that includes not only the monkeys, the New World monkeys and the Old World monkeys that I mentioned, but it also includes things like the lemurs, in Madagascar. It includes uh, uh, lorises, what we call prosimian primates, tarsiers, and it includes the great apes. So all of those are primates. And I'm not a, I'm not a taxonomic specialist in, in, in this kind of thing, but primates are distinguished by having hands that have nails instead of claws. So they have fingernails instead of claws and their eyes are in the front of their heads um, instead of on the sides of their heads, you know, like a cat or a dog, the eyes are kind of on the sides of their heads. So there are very, there are characteristics that set primates apart, but primates, obviously the primates are humans closest animal relatives. And that's why a lot of people like to study primates. Another really great question. Okay, last but not least, Nevaeh and Hunter, your last question from Meg. 
Meg, we would like to know if you've ever experienced um, a leukistic animal in the Amazon. Just the melanistic jaguar, but not the leucistic. No, I haven't seen a leucistic. Um, now I'm trying to think because somebody told me once about, it could be that there, there have been seen like a white a leucistic jaguar, but I'm not, I have never seen one. I know that the black jaguars is only about 5% of the total, total population. So I assume that the white ones would be way, way rare. <laughs> okay, we're gonna end with just a couple here left in the chat. Um, there's still quite a few questions, so we're, we're trying to squeeze in as many as we can here. Um, but we're gonna ask um, the one from Mari from State Street Elementary, um, kind of will combine two questions. They would like to know why are there so many fires happening in the rainforest? And then we also have a question um, related to why the trees are being cut down, especially from farmers. The sand, um, Sandpiper Elementary is curious, like why farmers are cutting the trees down. Mm -hmm. So the fires are really caused, deforestation and cutting, those are related questions, definitely, Kate, because the most of the fires in the Amazon are caused when people cut down the trees, they let the, for, the, they let the cut trees dry out, and then they set fire to them in order to plant pasture or to plant crops. Um, the reason why people are doing that is, um, is complex. So my programs that I work on are primarily areas that are set aside for conservation. And so cutting trees in those areas is illegal um, because that's been set aside. It's like cutting down trees in the national parks around you, it wouldn't be allowed. But there are areas where it is legal to cut down trees in the Amazon and to plant crops for your family or for, for sale. Um, but there are limits on what you can do um, in terms of the amount of forest that you can cut down because what we wanna make sure is that there's enough land for everybody in the Amazon and we need to make sure that it's used wisely. Um, a, lot of, a lot of speculation and land speculation goes on where people cut down the trees in order to show that they have control over an area and then that doesn't really get put to any productive use. So that's what we want to avoid is sort of destructive deforestation um, that doesn't serve local people. Okay, we're going to wrap up with one last question from Mr. Holland's seventh grade biology class that want to know what can we do every day to help support wildlife, flora and fauna around the world? Well, we can definitely, there are, there are um, for those of you who have home fix up projects and things like that, you can make sure that you don't buy um, wood or timber that comes from the endangered species in the Amazon. Um, there's a program called the Forest Stewardship Council that um, certifies whether timber has been uh, sustainably harvested. And that's something that's good to look for on um, paper products as well as on lumber or timber products that you might use for a home, um, home fix up project. Um, you can also, as I said, support um, the livelihoods of people in the Amazon by, by buying Brazil nuts and acai and, and palm fruits and look for things that have a, um, a fair trade label that may have been made or produced in the Amazon. And you know that that is benefiting local people and the livelihoods of those that live there. So those would be two specific things I'd say. Those are all 
great pointers that I think we can all try to incorporate into our everyday lives. So we are just about at time. I think, unfortunately, we're running out of time here. So I want to thank everyone for joining us, those that watched on camera and on the website. We really appreciate you guys being here and asking your questions. I also want to give a huge thanks to Meg for spending time with us to share about her experiences in Amazon and teach us some, some really cool facts about this really special place. So for teachers and parents, that are looking for additional educational resources to, that you can tie with Meg's presentation here. We've created a Kahoot quiz, which if you're not familiar with Kahoot, it is a completely free online uh, trivia quiz platform that um, all you have to do is visit that website you see on your screen there, kahoot.it, and then enter the special game pin. All of this information is also on our website where you are watching from or where you registered initially, so you can find that information there as well and take a fun little quiz based on Meg's presentation. There's also a fun app available, the WWF Forest app, which is an augmented reality reality app that will turn your classroom or living room into a forest. So it's a really cool way to learn more about forest conservation. And then you can also check out our Wild Classroom webpage to see our Tiger Toolkit, which has activities based on forest conservation, as well as a discussion guide based on the Our Jungles episode of the Our Planet series on Netflix. If you have more questions for Meg that we didn't have time to answer today or that we didn't get to, you can always email them to us at wildclassroom at wwfus.org. And we will do our best to get those passed over to Meg and and get some answers back to you. And be sure to mark your calendars for our February Conservation in the Classroom events. We have a very ocean themed month next month. On February 9th, we have Nadia Boud, a marine scientist and climate change officer with WWF that's gonna be presenting on mangroves and coral reefs. And then on February 18th, we have Mike Osman, our senior program officer with our oceans team doing a presentation on humpback whales. So be sure to join us for that. Thank you all again. We'll see you next time. Meg, we really appreciate having you. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, we're out.